Good morning, good afternoon, excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, speakers and participants. Uh, welcome to uh, the workshop on the promotion of intergenerational equity for sustainable development. Uh, my name is Aminata Touré, and I'm a former Prime Minister of Senegal and member of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration uh, called SEPA. I will be moderating uh, this event for the two coming hours. Uh, the workshop uh, form part of a series of uh, workshop uh, that deal with the SEPA principle of effective governance for sustainable development. Uh, the first workshops on the principle of sound policy making took place uh, last year. And today we will deal with the principle of intergenerational equity, uh, one of the 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development. Uh, to promote prosperity and quality of life for all, for all people, institutions should act in ways that balance uh, the short-term needs of today's generation with uh, the longer-term needs of future generation. Uh, we will hear today a number of national and global perspectives about how to ensure uh, fairness and equity between generations uh, from a range of experts. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a large number of uh, speakers and participants and bio of the experts are on the uh, event uh, webpage, so you can, you, you can look for them if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about the speakers. And I will not introduce them uh, to, to, for the sake of time. Uh, before giving uh, the floor to the speakers, let me start by referring to some uh, quick housekeeping item for, our, for your intention. Uh, I would like to inform you uh, that the workshop uh, will be recorded. Um, I would like to ask all speakers to have uh, the audio on mute uh, when, you are not, uh, when you are not speaking um, for the sake of uh, you know, good listening and good understanding and to minimize also the background noise and echo. And do not forget, of course, to unmute yourself if you are given the, the, the floor. Um, I would like also to ask participants to use the chat uh, to ask a question throughout the event. And we may ask the speakers to respond to your chat question. Um, if you are invited to take the floor at the end, please unmute yourself and state your name and, uh, and, and institution and also uh, country. So please keep your question uh, concise in the chat or if you are given the chance to speak so we can hear uh, from uh, many participants today. So we will now uh, begin our, our, our workshop. And it is my uh, greatest pleasure to invite uh, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatalo Lisano, who is uh, Assistant Secretary General for Policy, Coordination and Interagency Affairs, UNDESA, to set the stage of our workshop. Many thanks, Ms. Spato Lisano, uh, for your insightful remark. Uh, so I uh, will give you the floor. I will give uh, the floor to speakers to uh, answer, to present then and afterward uh, their national perspective. Uh, so many thanks, uh, Miss. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our workshop on intergenerational equity for sustainable development. And I am especially pleased that, that uh, Ms. Amina Touré, the former Prime Minister of Senegal and a member of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration, is facilitating indeed this session today. As is, uh, uh, Dr. Touré said, this is uh, the third in a series of workshops to launch the strategy, the strategy guidance notes for the 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development. 
the strategy guidance notes are designed to help operationalize and give content to those 11 principles, which were developed by the committee itself and endorsed then in 2018 by the ECOSOC, the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Last year, we held workshops on the principle of sound policy making. Today, we cover the principle of intergenerational equity, that is the balancing of short-term needs of today's generations, generation with the longer-term needs of future generations. Fairness between generations is embedded in the concept of sustainable development. The 2030 Agenda recognizes the importance of intergenerational equity and recognizes that the future of humanity and of our planet lies not only in our hands, but also in the hands of today's younger generation who will pass then the torch to future generations. As you know, we are in the midst of a fourth industrial resolution and we have seen a meteoric rise in technological advancement in all spheres of life. Decisions are made today that will shape the course of the planet for centuries. Yet the dominant political, social and economic pathways remain focused heavily on the short term, prioritizing immediate gains at the expenses of longer term well-being. Distinguished colleagues, we need to place long-term analysis, plan and thinking at the heart of national governance systems. Governments need to devise policies both by minimizing harm and doing that which benefits present and future generations. Consideration for the needs of future generations would favor policies that work to the advantage of both present and future generations and which are least burdensome to the present generation. But where risks to the interest of future generations are reasonably clear and consequential, present generation should exercise caution and possibly forego some benefits. This is clear in the planetary crisis we face, including climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, which will only become more devastating and irreversible if left unchecked. Now, many countries have incorporated the concerns for future generations into their constitutional frameworks and in environmental legislation. And some countries, such as Canada, Singapore or the United Kingdom, have offices that specifically assess and advocate for the needs of future generations. We are pleased that representatives of some of those offices are here today to share their experiences. So distinguished participants' concern for future generations also requires education and awareness rising, strengthening civic education for sustainable development and leadership training, including for the youth, to advance intergenerational equity is crucial. Today, we have the largest generation of young people ever, close to 90% of whom live in developing countries and who face significant obstacles to achieving their full potential. Yes, the Secretary General report titled Our Common Agenda released by the Secretary General last year, attempts to deliver more for young people and succeeding generations, including through transforming education, skills, training, and lifelong learning. And it makes a range of proposals, for instance, for a futures laboratory, which is designed to build capacity and exchange good practices to enhance long-term thinking, forward action and adaptability. A special envoy for future generations is also proposed, tasked with representing the interests of those who are expected to be born the coming century. 
At the same time, we have rapidly aging population in some countries, which presents its own sets of challenges and we cannot neglect, as if we are lucky, we will all get old. Distinguished colleagues, the principle of intergenerational equity is multifaceted. Today, we will explore certain aspects of the principle in the form of strategy guidance notes on the impact assessment for sustainable development, long-term public debt management, long-term territorial planning and spatial development, and ecosystem management. The authors of the papers will share the key highlights. In conclusion, rethinking our roles as custodians for future generations, as we are doing in this workshop, is imperative. We may also consider how to measure intergenerational equity in public policy making, no matter the approach that any one country may take. International and regional institutions have a significant role to play in supporting governments in their efforts to consider the needs of current and future generations in policy making processes and also in building strong institutions for the SDGs. And we are also very pleased at the involvement of resident coordinators and members of the United Nations country teams in this initiative. DESA stands ready, as always, to join these efforts. So I wish you a successful workshop and look forward to your deliberations. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Spatolisano, who is, uh, I recall, the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs. Thank you for your insightful remarks. I will now uh, move to give the floor to the speakers to present their national perspective. I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Joachim Stan who is the chairperson of the Committee for the Future of Parliament. He's from Finland. Uh, Mr. Stan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon from, from the sea between Finland and Sweden. I'm actually on one of the most environmental friendly passenger ferries in the world. And I hope that you can hear me when we are driving through ice here. As chairman of the Committee for the Future of the Parliament of Finland, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to offer the Finnish perspective on today's topic. The Committee for the Future is an established standing committee in the Parliament of Finland, and it consists of 17 members of Parliament. Uh, it serves like a think tank for futures, science and technology policy in Finland, and the counterpart cabinet member is the prime minister. This committee was established in 1993 and uh, on major future problems and opportunities. The dialogue of futures between the government and the parliament realized through the government reports and committee reports constitutes a long-term policy instrument for managing transgenerational policy challenges. At least once during its term of office, the government issues a report on long-term future prospects and the government's targets, which is submitted from the Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's office to the Parliament. The main task of the Committee for the Future is then to prepare the Parliament's response to this government's future report. The Parliament reports are submitted to the government, which must take the proposed resolutions into consideration. So by this way, the Finnish government and parliament can recognize important political themes at such an early stage that different alternatives and policy lines are still completely open and under development. Committee's other tasks are statements to other committees in relation to other government reports or budgets and foresight projects and reports to examining uh, different kinds of social issues and technological development. The most important efforts are devoted to these committees' own issues, our own projects. The power, actually, one of the 
pillars of the strength of the committee, the 17 parliamentarians themselves stake out policy lines for the future. So we can take into account all the individual parliamentarians' uh, interests. Uh, the time perspective is long and the scale of issues very broad. In the previous electoral term, topics uh, researched by the committee uh, included the post-truth era, the sharing economy, platform economy, uh, education exports and social confrontation. Uh, during this electoral term, uh, we are reviewing topics such as radical innovations, sustainable development, the use of artificial intelligence in governance and decision making, uh, the reason from the social malaise and the ethics of technology. Since 2017, the government's implementation of, uh, for Agenda 2030 for sustain, Sustainable Development is also submitted to the Committee for the Future during each electoral term. Finland actually was one of the first countries to devise a report on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, the report was presented in April 2016 in a meeting of the United Nations Political Forum on Sustainable Development and also acted as an intermediate report for the National 2030 Agenda program. The Agenda 2030 work of the government is based on the national implementation plans that are submitted to the Parliament's government's Agenda 2030 reports. First such report was submitted in January 2017 and it described then Prime Minister Juha Sipilas government's efforts to promote sustainable development and the 2030 Agenda. Current Prime Minister Sanna Marin's government updated the implementation plan and submitted it to Parliament in autumn 2020. Finland's strategy in the 2030 Agenda implementation is twofold. First, to show government's political leadership and commitment and secondly, to engage the whole society and stakeholders in the implementation by participatory partnerships. In the Parliament, the Committee for the Future is leading the follow-up of the government's work on the 2030 Agenda implementation. There's a continuous dialogue between the Committee for the Future and the Prime Minister's Office. The Committee for the Future deals with the government reports, uh, agenda implementation plans, uh, the government's annual reports and state budget proposals, related to the 2030 Agenda. On the basis of the statements drafted by the Committee for the Future and amended by other relevant and interested parliamentary committees, the Parliament forms a joint position to the government's reports. During the drafting process, all committees consult with experts and also arrange public consultations, allowing wider participation by stakeholders. Some public consultations have been arranged as joint meetings of several committees with a view to contrib contributing to the policy coherence included in the 2030 Agenda. The dialogue between the government and the parliament has proved to be very fruitful, improving understanding of sustainable development and raising awareness of the 2030 Agenda among all political parties and members of, of parliament. Effective implementation of the 2030 Agenda at national level requires well-established follow-up structures, but also regular and independent evaluation of sustainability policies. The Government of Finland is committed to commission an independent evaluation of national implementation of the 2030 Agenda every four years. The purpose of independent evaluation organized towards the end of the electoral period is to produce fact-based content on sustainability issues and government's progress on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The first national evaluation report was published in spring 2019. Its findings and recommendations were brought into pre-electoral debate and they supported the new government in the preparation of the government program and in the update of the government's implementation plan. So the current government has committed to commission in an independent external evaluation of the implementation of the 2030 agenda uh, next winter. Finally, just a few more words about intergenerational equity. The government is presently preparing its next report on the future of Finland of future generations. As part of its work, the prime minister's office organized 50 dialogues on the future of Finland representatives of different generations, especially young people and genders and people from a variety of backgrounds and 
walks of life were invited to participate. Do not usually take part in discussions on the future, will get involved in reflecting on the future of Finland. The Committee for the Futures report on the future of Finland of future generations be completed in autumn 2022. I think that's exactly about nine minutes, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joachim Stran, for sharing uh, this perspective uh, from, uh, from, from Finland. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Sophie Hau, who is from Future Generation uh, Commissioner. She's from uh, Wales in the, in the UK. Uh, Ms. Hau, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon um, from the UK or good morning um, or good evening, wherever you may be. It's my pleasure to, um, to be with you um, here today. I'm going to um, share some slides. So as you heard, I'm, um, I'm Sophie Howe. I am the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Um, my job as set out in law in our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is to act as the guardian of the interests of the future generations of Wales. And I'll um, tell you a little bit more about what that means um, in practice as I speak to you this afternoon. Um, I suppose, you know, the question that we're all posing is how will our actions, the things that we're doing today, um, affect people in say 50 years time or 100 years time or 200 years time? Will the things that we're doing now be seen as a tragedy? Um, will future generations say what on earth were they thinking? Um, and will what we're doing now meet the good ancestor test? Um, are the things that we're doing going to ensure um, a good future for those yet to be born or not? And I think if we look back to how we kind of once marvelled um, at the introduction of mass produced cars, opening up travel to thousands of people in the Western world, we saw that cars were the ultimate status symbol um, and indeed the type of car that you have um, still is. It's a nod to our ongoing obsession with, um, with things, an obsession which has led um, certainly the Western world to consume vastly more than our fair share of resources. But now, of course, we're realising the impact of millions of people driving fuel guzzling cars um, that, that the impact that that's had on the environment especially when you see cars floating in the streets of climate disaster struck towns. And we can in some ways give our ancestors a free pass. There wasn't anywhere near the technological advancements then that we have now to predict the future. But we don't have the same excuse. We know what's coming and we know that we need to do something about it. About it. The issue for us to question is whether we are brave enough um, to do that. And in Wales, we have taken some brave decisions to ensure that we are considering the interests of future generations in our policy and political cycles. Because the problem with governance across the world is that it's short term. That's arguably why we see ourselves um, in this position of a climate emergency. It's arguably um, why we can find money to deal with a pandemic, but we can't find money to deal with health inequality um, and long term population health. And so we're trying to change that a brave decision by our government back in 2015 to legislate to protect the interests of future generations. So the Future Generations Act does a number of things. First of all, it puts a requirement, a legal requirement on all 44 of our main public institutions, all of our local authorities or municipalities at a regional level, um, all of our health organisations um, are in Environment Agency, our Public Health Agency, and significantly the Welsh Government itself, to demonstrate how it's taking decisions in a way which meets today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It then sets out seven long term national well-being goals and we have seven, but they are closely linked back to the UN, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. So each one of these has a statutory definition attached to it. It's worth referencing the statutory definition in Wales of a prosperous Wales, um, which uh, traditionally you might think of about being improving GDP. 
but actually our definition in Wales is a productive, innovative, low carbon society, which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, which acts on climate change and which develops a well-educated population with the skills to enable them to access decent work. So quite a progressive definition, taking us more towards um, a well-being economy, which protects the interests of both people and planet. And the duties on all 44 of those public bodies are to set objectives which maximise their contribution to all seven of those wellbeing goals. It then sets out five ways of working that our public bodies have to demonstrate and are audited um, upon. They have to demonstrate how they're planning for the long term, how they're preventing problems from occurring or getting worse, how they're integrating their thinking, so recognising the connections between each of these goals. So it becomes just as much the responsibility of our national health institutions to reduce carbon emissions to meet the goal of a prosperous and resilient Wales as it does to improve people's health, to recognise the connections between planetary health and human health. It becomes just as much the responsibility of our economy department to think about how they secure decent jobs in a low carbon economy because that has a direct impact on people's health, on cohesive communities, on a more equal Wales. So this integrated approach, it requires them to collaborate, so to work with each other across the public, private and third sector, and it requires them to involve citizens in the decision making process. And then finally, it establishes an independent commissioner, myself, to oversee the implementation of this legislation and to hold the government and others to account on how they are progressing in meeting these seven long term goals. And people often ask, why should we put future generations first when we have so many current problems and challenges to deal with? And my answer is, is that that's not putting the interests of future jail, considering the interests of future generations and current generations um, is not mutually exclusive. Instead, they're intrinsically linked to each other. So just as our current generations um, are extremely, uh, intrinsically linked to past generations, our ancestors, the decisions that we make today should help current generations, but should also seek to understand how the future will impact upon them. And we should seek to do the things that are good for both generations so if we think about meeting our decarbonisation uh, targets through transport, investing in high quality public transport and modes of active travel are good for human health in, in the here and now. They're good for reducing our carbon emissions targets. They're good for reducing inequality and it's good for creating cohesive communities. All of um, the goals there in our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And so we need to be thinking about choosing to do the things that are good for both current and future generations. So what difference is our act making in Wales? Well, one of the biggest early interventions that I made as a commissioner was to intervene in plans for the government to build a um, two billion pound motorway extension um, to deal with a problem of congestion. And I posed the question, can you explain to me how you've considered long term trends and scenarios? Can you explain to me how this will be preventing um, issues such as climate change, such, such as obesity, such as ecological resilience when the proposals were to go through um, a nature reserve. Can you explain to me how you've considered um, how you are going to meet your seven long-term wellbeing goals here, when actually what we need to be doing to improve people's health is to get people out of their cars and onto public transport and active travel to reduce pollution. If only 25% of the lowest income families um, in that region, if 25% of those families don't have access to a car, how are we spending this money in a way which is promoting an equal Wales? How are we spending this money in line with the climate emergency? And that decision was changed as a result of the Future Generations Act and that road building scheme was cancelled. And we've gone further in Wales to completely reform how we do transport planning and to put a moratorium on all future road building in Wales for all schemes to be reviewed in light of the obligations under the Future Generations Act. We've established a climate ministry, which includes all of the key levers to tackle the climate emergency, housing, planning, transport, 
um, nature and so on. And already this year we're seeing record investment in tackling the climate emergency through improving the quality of people's homes to insulate them more effectively through investing in nature based solutions and investing in renewables. We've reformed our education curriculum, so we're no longer teaching our children um, by imparting knowledge and rote learning skills of the past, but instead we're teaching them the skills of the future, skills around cooperation, empathy, emotional intelligence, teamwork, critical thinking, and the principles which underpin our curriculum are creating healthy and active citizens, creative and enterprising learners, and ethical and informed citizens, principles which link back to our seven wellbeing goals. In order to recognise and tackle the long-term impacts of poverty, Wales will pilot a universal basic income looking to provide a basic income initially to a group of care leavers in order to deal with the specific problems and challenges that poverty caused to that group, but to look at the longer term and wider benefits that that could bring to our communities. And we are, a zero, we are working towards being a zero waste nation by 2050. And one of the interesting things about our waste strategy is looking at the connections between things. The people who have developed that wealth waste strategy have also considered how do they address poverty and community cohesion in doing that. So things like community sharing uh, libraries, libraries of things, community repair cafes, where you can go along and have uh, maybe your appliance or your phone fixed, whilst also connecting with people in your community, recognizing that so many people are lonely and isolated. So when we start seeing those connections, when we start finding the things that can both help current and future generations, um, there are some really wonderful things that can happen. What I want to see across the world, and of course, the Secretary General has recently proposed um, in the common um, agenda framework, the um, establishment of a special envoy for future generations, a declaration for future generations and reforms to the trusteeship council. Imagine if the UN infrastructure and every country in the world had an obligation in the way they go about taking decisions and making public policy to consider and protect the interests of future generations. That is the way that we can certainly say that we are good ancestors. Thank you. Dr. Tureyo Mike is, thank you. Yes, I was, uh, sorry, I was thanking uh, Madam Sophie Howe, uh, who is the Future Generation Commissioner in Wales for sharing her, her insights um, about uh, what is uh, being done in Wales. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Dunstone Ulwadi, who is the Assistant Director of the National Treasure and Planning in Kenya. Uh, Dr. Dunstan, uh, the floor is yours. Doctor, Doctor. We do have some uh, difficulties having him maybe. Dr. Ture, I will check. Uh, I will check the technical connection for him, and uh, we can go to the next. So one. should we should we move to the next, sir, huh? and maybe come back to him? Indeed, yes, please. Yeah. So I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Jerry De Marco. Mr. Jerry De Marco is the Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development uh, in Canada, and uh, uh, Miss Kimberly Leach, who is uh, the Principal Officer of the Auditor General Office in Canada. Uh, so, uh, Dr. DeMarco and Ms. Leach, uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you for the invitation to join you all today. Given that the focus of this workshop series is on effective governance, I wish to point out that having strong institutions, as noted in UN Sustainable Development Goal number 16, like independent Auditor General offices that hold government to account, where Ms. Leach and I work, is a key part of fostering sustainable development. 
If we could go to the next slide, I'll just give you an overview of our presentation today. I'll cover point number one, intergenerational equity in Canada, and Ms. Leach will cover points two, three, and four. Next slide, please. Canada has legislated intergenerational equity in the Federal Sustainable Development Act. But the curious thing about uh, this legislation is that the principle of intergenerational equity on the left side of the screen before you is that it is important to meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And if you look to the right side of the screen, it's nearly the identical definition of sustainable development in that same piece of legislation, as well as in the legislation that created my position as commissioner of the Auditor General Act. So this circular definition is such that if we were to use Canada's uh, legislation to interpret the name of today's meeting, which is the workshop on the promotion of intergenerational equity for sustainable development, it would be something like the workshop on the promotion of sustainable development for sustainable development. So this is a weakness in our legislation is that there isn't a strong definition of what intergenerational equity is within the overall concept of sustainable development. Next slide. In looking at Canada's climate change performance over the past 30 years, and this was, this was our own office's attempt to operationalize intergenerational equity, by looking at a report period of several decades rather than the typical few years that uh, our audit reports look at. We went all the way back to when Canada was showing leadership on the climate change file uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And at the bottom of this quote in Canada's official speech to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, you'll see that Canada said that our children, the Rio generation, will be our judges and beneficiaries. And that was in the context of the, uh, the crises of climate change and biodiversity and the conventions that were signed at Rio. And if you fast forward nearly 30 years to the next slide, Canada's statement in the throne speech of 2019, we say that Canada's children and grandchildren will judge this generation by its action or inaction on the defining challenge of, the of our time, which is climate change. So what has happened over these 27 years such that we have almost the same statement from Canada Canada's government about our next generation being able to judge its, its performance? And we'll see that on the next slide, which is taken from our recent report on lessons learned from Canada's record on climate change. So from the time that Canada was speaking about its concerns for future generations and that it's the future generation would be our judges and beneficiaries in the early 90s, amongst all G7 nations, Canada has the worst trend line in emissions. And so to answer Ms. Howe, Commissioner Howe's uh, question via uh, Jonas Salk, are we be good ancestors? No, Canada has on the file of climate change has not been a good ancestor, despite our commitments and many plans illustrated on the slide over the years, Canada's emissions have gone up by approximately 20% since we first made our commitments to stabilize and then significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So actions speak louder than words. And in this case, Canada's actions have not followed the strong words regarding climate change and future generations. And on the next slide, we do summarize some of the words that Canada has um, employed in, in uh, adopting intergenerational equity and sustainable development in Canada. As I mentioned back in the early 90s, we spoke clearly about the need to protect the interests of future generations and how they would be our judges and beneficiaries. And over the years, that's been operationalized in some ways in Canada by the creation, for example, in 1995 of the Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, the, the position that I currently hold, and the inclusion in that legislation of a new clause regarding respect for nature and the needs of future generations. Over the years, there have been other developments 
fast forward to 2020, where there's the Federal Sustainable Development Act amendment to include explicitly intergenerational equity as a principle to consider when developing federal sustainable development strategies. These are some of the mechanisms that have been put in place, but uh, working in the Office of the Auditor General, which judges Canada's performance on sustainable development, including performance on intergenerational equity, the conclusion on uh, of our office on the climate change file, for example, is that Canada has not done a good job in operationalizing intergenerational equity in the form, for example, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions since its first commitments in the early 1990s. I will now turn over the floor to Ms. Leach from our office to talk about how our office, as an Auditor General's office, seeks to implement sustainable development goals and intergenerational equity. Ms. Leach. Thanks very much, Jerry, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for having us as part of this workshop today. Um, I'm a principal at the Office of the Auditor General of Canada, uh, where I've been auditing uh, environment and sustainable development issues for the last 20 years or so. So um, although, as Jerry said, we're just beginning our journey on intergenerational equity in our office, uh, we've been working very hard since 2017 or so to integrate the sustainable development goals into our work. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that today. Um, and, and this work is really driven by the fact that auditors around the world have a very important role to play in terms of accountability. And we can help measure, monitor, and verify progress toward, uh, of our governments and our society towards Agenda 2030 and the world that we want. So uh, in Canada at this time, all performance audits and several other types of the work um, that we do must consider um, how they are aligned with the sustainable development goals um, during all phases of our work in planning, examination, and reporting, for example. And this is true whether you're doing an audit on things like defense procurement, um, vaccine rollout, or nuclear waste, for example. All audits must consider, consider the, how the government is contributing to the SDGs. And to support this, we have a specialist team, which is led by me, uh, to provide advice on how to do this for all teams in our office. And uh, we also develop guidance on how to do this for, for several um, for our staff. And if we move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit, little bit about some of the other things that we do. Um, so for example, in addition to integrating the SDGs into our audit work, we've also uh, completed two government-wide audits that consider the sustainable development goals. So the first we completed in 2018, and this looked at how prepared our government was to implement the sustainable development goals. And as you may know, and as many of you perhaps participated in as well, many other countries around the world did a similar type of audit um, as supported by several uh, UN agencies, including uh, UNDESA, and as reported at the high level political forum uh, on several occasions. Um, the second audit that we government wide audit that we did in Canada looked at how our government uh, was implementing the sustainable development goals and this was published in April of 2021. And we looked at how our government was doing on specific targets such as gender equality, for example, um, and uh, youth youth unemployment. So, uh, and Jerry has already explained um, that we have a, a Federal Sustainable Development Act in Canada, which requires the government to produce federal sustainable development strategies. And it also requires the federal departments and agencies to develop their own strategies every three years. And it requires us to audit their progress um, towards implementing these strategies every year. So a new cycle of these strategies has just begun. And in fact, the new, the new strategy is, is a federal strategy overall. The draft strategy is due to be released today, I believe. And we are going to be expecting these strategies to consider how federal plans and policies uh, integrate in an intergenerational, intergenerational equity. And if we move to the next slide, uh, we can talk about, um, about the fact that um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, we, we have a process for identifying and selecting the topics that we will audit in future years. And last year, for example, we had several um, 
several criteria that we used for identifying such audit work. And we used alignment of these topics with the SDGs and with gender and inclusivity, for example, as ways to identify the things that we wanted to audit um, for the future. And some of the current work that we have coming out uh, in 2022, for example, is listed on the slide here. So we're looking at a just transition to a low carbon economy. We're looking at um, how our carbon pricing system is working now and for the future. And, uh, and also things like how our, our own government is reducing its greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and nuclear waste is another topic that we'll be reporting on this year, um, which is an interesting intergenerational issue as well. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, but I just wanted to point out that we have published other work that considers things like long-term fiscal sustainability, as well as fairness to current and future generations um, in our public service pension boards, for example. And we can move to the next slide. Um, where I, I have a few uh, lessons learned here, which was part of what we were asked to talk about. And um, although we don't, you know, we're just getting started on uh, intergenerational equity, we have learned a lot of lessons about integrating sustainable development goals into our audit work. Um, so some of these will be, will be applicable, and I won't talk about all of them, but um, the first one um, is something that has been very critical in, in our in our office, which is, um, you know, the tone from the top. Um, two successive auditors general in our office have been 100% behind the the initiative to to audit the sustainable development goals, and that has been been an incredible um, incentive and and help to to move this forward in our office. So as I know, it has been in others as well. And the last lesson learned here, a common international approach. Um, again, um, as I mentioned, many different countries in the world have, have used a common approach to, to, uh, to audit um, progress towards the sustainable development goals. And that, that international approach was also extremely helpful. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, I just want to spend a minute talking about our challenges and and uh, and opportunities. So most of our challenges, as Jerry uh, referenced, are are really related to the fact that our institutions have yet to define uh, intergenerational equity in a tangible way, or to set goals and targets to measure for this. Uh, most of our policies and programs, for example, do not explicitly embed this principle, and this makes auditing it a significant challenge. Um, however, on the opportunity side, um, our new federal sustainable development strategy, which is to be released in draft today, as I mentioned, um, we, we're going to review this as per our requirements to do so and ensure that it considers the concept of intergenerational equity and that it gives direction to departments and agencies to consider how to do this in their own policies and programs. Um, so we're just beginning our, our journey on this, and and uh, and this is this is part of our uh, part of our, our challenges and our opportunities. And, and in my last slide, on the next one, please, um, I just like to close by referencing some of the work that we have recently published um, and tabled in Parliament in November. So this is our uh, Jerry referred to earlier. It's our lessons learned from Canada's record on climate change. So here we looked at 30 years of government action on climate change inaction or inaction as the case may be um, in Canada, as well as our 20 years of audits on this topic. And we wanted to see what lessons we could learn that would enable success for current and future generations. And uh, one of our lessons, lesson eight, uh, discusses how climate change is, is an intergenerational crisis with a rapidly closing window for action. And it poses questions here for government, which have already generated some very good um, questions and discussions uh, with our parliament. So thanks very much. That's that's all I had to say about that for now. And uh, we're happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. DiMarco and uh, Ms. Lish for sharing this experience uh, from Canada. Let me backtrack a little bit because it seems that we do have uh, Dr. Dunstone on the line. Is he in? Yes, yes, I'm in. Oh, welcome, Dr. Dunstone. So uh, I recall that yes. uh, you are the Assistant Director at the National Treasury and Planning of Kenya. So, Dr. Yes. the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm going to present, I think, uh, within, I think, uh, seven minutes or so, uh, just yes. brief, uh, 
uh, the experience of uh, Kenya and especially in relation to the subject matter of today. So uh, what I can say about Kenya is that uh, the concept of uh, sustainable development and therefore the concept of uh, intergenerational equity is actually enshrined in the law, in the constitution of Kenya. And uh, what I can also add there is that uh, the right to a clean and healthy environment, which is in Italia includes the right to have um, the environment protected for the benefits of the present and the future generation, is a subject that is uh, Uh, we are losing you, Dr. Damson. Unfortunately, it seems that we have issue. Doctor, do you hear us? I will check with Dr. Dunstan yes. and we'll reverse. Yes, we will have to move. And we'll, we'll give him a chance though to come back in the discussion. It seems like his line is uh, not very stable. So now I will then uh, move on and I have the, the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Jim Matsemela, uh, who is the Chief Director at Strategy and Risk Management at the National Treasury of South Africa on second month to the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative. So uh, Mr. Matsemela, uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Ture, apologies. Mr. Maximella could not join us today. We can proceed yeah. to Ms. Sarah Sikeni. Thank you. All right. So, okay. So we're going to, well, let me try again to see whether we can have Dr. Dunstan. Dr. Dunstan? Okay. So uh, let me just move now to, um, you know, hear an experience from Laos. So I have now the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Ms. Sarah Sekenes, who is the United Nations Resident Coordinator in Laos. Uh, so, uh, Madam, you do have the floor, uh, Ms. Sekenes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, morning from Laos. PR. It is a pleasure to be part of this panel and have the opportunity to share some perspectives from our work here. First, in context, uh, Lao PDR has the youngest population in mainland Southeast Asia. 69% are under the age of 25. At the same time, the offer of opportunities is limited to its young population, and the youth unemployment rate currently stands at 18.2%, and those not in employment, education, or training at 42%. And with changing patterns of fertility and mortality, Lao is now in the early stages of a demographic transition that it will see that will see the future structure, profile, and needs of the population change profoundly. By 2030, it is projected that the share of the population below 15 years of age will fall from 33% to 25%. We know this because of our collective investments in statistical capacity, including DESA's support to monitoring of the SDGs, for example, and support to a uh, national regular census through UNFPA, which are crucial steps in building the conditions for greater intergenerational equity. We also know that with the right policies in place, this transition can create the potential for a one-off transformational shift in the national development trajectory. Without these investments, it could, however, also easily become an unrecoverable missed opportunity, leaving people behind in poverty with higher levels of inequality that may set the stage for mounting economic frustrations and their potential consequences. Lao PDR's development model, uh, which until recently has consistently delivered high rates of economic growth, has relied heavily on uh, debt financed investments in major infrastructure projects and natural resource extraction. If selected, planned, designed, and implemented well, these can create the potential productive capacities to open up for new opportunities for future generations that would not have been possible without such transformative investments. But they could also risk creating unaffordable liabilities in the form of significant debt levels or unsustainable depleting natural assets. Any of these consequences could play out in the space of one generation, 
considering how decisions being made now will affect those growing up in just a, uh, the coming decade or two. Importantly also, as been mentioned uh, by other speakers, these different possible trajectories could only continue thereafter, or would only continue de de thereafter, with the consequences of the choices we make now for the lives of the Laotians of the future getting starker as we move forward. So in this context, it is critical to tackle some of the tough questions now about how to factor considerations of intergenerational equity into decision making. And this is also well acknowledged in Laos' ninth National Socioeconomic Development Plan endorsed last year and running to 2025. This includes a clear focus on making investments in high quality health and education, expand access to social protection to uh, equip children and youth with the capabilities necessary to succeed, it commits to sustainably managing debt levels and ensuring macroeconomic stability. And it also includes clear commitments to shifting the nature of growth in a greener and more environmentally sustainable direction. For example, by sustainably using and managing natural resources and building capacities for disaster prevention, management and recovery. The challenges come in how to implement these policies in practice when farsighted aspirations meet the harsh reality of immediate needs and budget constraints. In Laos, fiscal space was already constrained prior to the impact of the ongoing pandemic. And over the past two years, we've seen this situation becoming even more urgent. Government re revenue has a, as a share of GDP fell from 21 to 11 percent between 2016 to 2021. So despite the commitments made, we have seen government spending on education fall consistently short of plans. Similarly, for spending on health, in fact, budget analysis indicates the spending on health and education appear to have fallen by a third over the past five years. And despite the aspirations to shift to more environmentally sustainable growth trajectory, we still see discussions on, for example, increasing mining and building coal power plants to help revive the economy. But in an economic situation that is struggling to overcome the consequences of COVID-19 and this truly pressing need to generate economic opportunities for the growing population, one can understand the challenges. It is essential to promote a human-centered recovery to the pandemic uh, with gender responsive and inclusive policies and programs to close widening inequalities, providing social protection from infancy until old age th throughout the life cycle, as it were. And therein lies the central question that I'd like to raise here today. How best can we work to support national authorities to implement their much desired sustainable long-term visions and that can take account of the imperatives of intergenerational equity as the Laos ninth NSEDP does when confronted by urgent needs that push in another direction? And how do we ensure that today's children and youth both benefit from and improve upon the lessons of their parents and the past so that they have the capacities and access to sustainable and equitable livelihoods, services, and natural resources for the foreseeable future. As the UN, we've tried to structure our work in support of government efforts towards addressing this, aligning our initiatives that support the implementation of that longer term vision. For example, with the integrated work of ILO, UNICEF, and UNCDF to the practical implementation of the National Social Protection Strategy, including thinking creatively how this could be financed in the current fiscal environment. With UNDP's work in support of provincial investment plans that take into account longer term territorial planning and spatial development, and broader UNCT engagement uh, in natural resource management and green investment schemes and trade opportunities within the agro and forestry sector by, for example, FAO, UNEP, ITC, UNCTAD, to name a few. And these are also critical within the frameworks of the graduation strategy from a different leveling uh, playing field, so to say, from LDC status anticipated in 2026 for Lao PDR. But of course, uh, there are no easy answers to this. And this is exactly the kind of practical questions that we need to grapple with in order to find ways forward. It is also essential, as a final note, uh, in the discourse in elaboration of financing for development schemes within the framework of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development for all, including the least developed countries. I thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sarah Sekines, uh, who is the UN uh, Resident Coordinator in, in Laos.
Um, and I will try to also get back to Dr. Uh, uh, Dunstan Ulwadi, who is, uh, who will talk to us uh, from Kenya. I think now is the right time. Uh, Dr. Yes. Dunstan, yes. the floor is yes. yours. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I won't take much time. And uh, like I was saying, that the question of uh, intergenerational equity is enshrined in our, in our legal instruments, specifically the Constitution of Kenya, and also the, the PFM Act, which was enacted in 2012. But also in the context of my, uh, the ministry, that is the National Treasury, we have also enshrined the same concept in our debt and borrowing policy, which, which uh, was uh, approved by, uh, by the, the cabinet in 2020. So uh, how do we ensure that uh, intergenerational equity is uh, implemented uh, in all our strategies that uh, we undertake? In our ministry, we have what we call the medium-term debt strategy, which is a tool that uh, gives the government the sources of borrowing and uh, ensures that uh, the borrowing is done in a manner that is consistent with the law. Specifically, MTDS, which is uh, the acronym of uh, medium-term debt strategy, is prepared pursuant to a section of the PFM Act and uh, which is a document prepared uh, on an annual basis or it's reviewed on an annual basis. And, and so maybe if I quickly look at uh, how we ensure even the borrowing uh, that we do takes into account both the uh, future and the current and the future generation, we do it observing the following objectives. One, we borrow at minimum cost, um, and at uh, 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 and we also borrow over a long term, taking into account the issue of risk. Number two, uh, we borrow so that we can promote the development of the market institutions for government securities, and in so doing, we are actually in a way ensuring that the borrowing uh, becomes sustainable, not just in the medium term but also in the long term. But also another objective which we, we usually observe is that we ensure the sharing of the benefits uh, and costs of public debt between the current and future generation, which is also enshrined in our Public Finance Management Act uh, and also in the Constitution of Kenya. So how do we ensure that the cost and the risk that we, um, we pursue in the MTDS takes into account the intergenerational equity. We do that by one, ensuring that uh, the cost of debt is minimal. And how do we ensure the cost of debt is minimal? By looking at the interest payment against the, uh, the GDP. So if you look at that um, um, in 2020, interest as a percentage of GDP was at 4.4, but in 2021, it was at 4.4. 4.6. So we are also seeing uh, a lot of fluctuations in, uh, in, in that strategy. But ideally, we are saying we do manage intergenerational equity in borrowing by ensuring that uh, we borrow at minimum cost. And we also um, ensure borrowing is long term. The other, the other thing uh, that, that we do is uh, we look at also the other indicator, like, for example, the average time to maturity, which we have also uh, ensure that uh, we, 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 it's a long one. Initially in 2020, we had a figure of nine, but in 2021, the figure went to 11. So that tells you that uh, we are not just borrowing to overburden the current generation or to benefit the current generation. We are borrowing to ensure that also the future generation benefits from the borrowing. So the borrowing really has to ensure it takes into account both the future and uh, the current generation. And maybe as I conclude, uh, this document is an integral part of uh, what we are calling the prudent debt management that informs the optimal borrowing that the government engages in. And also the current uh, policy uh, which we are implementing, the policy of uh, fiscal consolidation is a policy that also aims at promoting uh, intergenerational equity. 
Because what, what that one does is we are reducing the fiscal deficits by uh, either increasing the revenue mobilization and reducing the expenditure expenditure on uh, uh, the expenditure on especially the infrastructural projects. And also we, we are saying that uh, um, the, the borrowing that we undertake, especially uh, 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 during this period of COVID, whereas, whereas uh, COVID was an issue, uh, we ensure that uh, we do not accelerate the borrowing to an extent that uh, it becomes a burden to us when it comes to servicing of, uh, of debt. So basically, from, from the context of um, the National Treasury and specifically the context of Public Debt Management Office, we observe and implement intergenerational principles through our borrowing strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Woody. We had a chance to, to hear from you and thank you for your, for your insight. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the second part of the, of the workshop where we will hear from the authors of the strategy guidance note that uh, some of the speaker referred to. So we will uh, start with the remark from Mr. Patrick Spearing who is the Secretary of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration. Uh, Mr. Spearing, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Facilitator. It's a pleasure to be with everybody today. Uh, we'd just like to connect a little bit the uh, comments made by our national presenters with the work that's going to be presented by uh, these experts in the specific practice areas. We heard from Wales uh, uh, about uh, questions that arise in connection with how to explain uh, long-term trends and scenarios. How have long-term uh, well-being goals been considered by various uh, departments and agencies? Uh, we have uh, Laos, uh, confronted with the question of what to do when uh, long-term objectives uh, uh, run into uh, budget uh, realities. We heard from Canada <clears throat> about the importance of, or the, the you know, the observation that action speaks louder than words. Well, what actions do we take exactly? Uh, so uh, what DESA has uh, done uh, to help with this is to engage leading experts to elaborate uh, guidance uh, notes on specific uh, practice areas that are uh, in the view of the uh, committee uh, connected with this principle of uh, intergenerational equity. So there are four guidance notes um, altogether that have been prepared and that will be presented by our, by our um, colleagues um, here today. Uh, the guidance notes are intended to provide action-oriented advice uh, to help those involved in policy making or in designing institutional arrangements to enable uh, intergenerational equity to be more, um, to be better reflected uh, in government um, action. The guidance notes themselves are linked on the website. You can, you can find them and we hope that you have time to, to read them and look at them if you're interested in these topics. They explain what these strategies are, what uh, the public sector situation and trends have been uh, over the years, what the basic building blocks are, how to go about um, um, uh, uh, taking actions in these different areas, <clears throat> and then how to connect with different research networks and, um, and uh, uh, peer learning and international cooperation uh, uh, opportunities. So given the time constraints, I'll go straight into it if you don't mind, Madam Facilitator. I think we have a, a recorded message from uh, Professor Richard Morgan, uh, who's based in, in New Zealand. Uh, given the time differences, it was not possible, I think, for him to join us in person. But we have a recorded message from him uh, telling us a bit more about uh, what, uh, what um, impact uh, assessment for sustainable de development uh, entails. So if we can play this uh, video. Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Morgan. I'm based down in New Zealand. So I'm sorry I can't join you live, given the uh, time difference. I'm just going to fire up my presentation here. Bear with me. So I'm going to talk about impact assessment in the context of sustainable development and intergenerational equity. So impact assessment is a, an anticipatory strategy. It's there to guide systematic and proportionate examination of our proposed actions, policies, plans, projects, and looking for the wider implications of those actions before we commit to them, before we make key decisions. 
We're looking at the implications for people and communities, natural and built environments. So we're looking at the real world, those aspects that could be affected by our actions and trying to capture that and feed it back into our development of those actions before we commit to them. So we're looking ahead and we're looking over the reasonably foreseeable life of those proposals to make that assessment. Therefore, it's a core tool for policy and plan making, for project design, for decision making generally in those sort of contexts. And it's our best way to minimise those things that come back to haunt us sometimes, the unexpected consequences. Now, just a footnote, I'm talking about impact assessment in that anticipatory ex ante sense. So we do it prior to decisions as distinct from ex post use of the term impact assessment, meaning uh, in the policy arena, have we have our policies had the desired impact? So we're looking at prior to decisions use of this thinking. What does it contribute? Well, clearly the information about wider implications is core. When we say wider, what we mean is the unintended outcomes of a proposal as opposed to what we were intending to achieve. So things beyond what we thought we were going to achieve. And those things come about due to direct and indirect pathways of cause and effect that can ripple out from an activity once it's implemented into areas we hadn't thought about. There are also things called induced effects and cumulative effects and so on. These are aspects that impact assessors look at when they're carrying out their systematic exploration of the potential changes that could occur. We're particularly interested in those that cause harm because those are the things that we really want to avoid. But we're also looking at wider benefits that might not have been recognized initially, but we can bring that in and enhance proposals. So in that sense, impact assessment is helping to shape policies and plans as they develop. Similarly with projects, if we have it in the project cycle from the earliest stages of design, right through to fine tuning to suit local conditions, then we're feeding this information in uh, all the way through. Importantly, impact assessment can enable stakeholders in affected communities participate in processes in an informed way. We talk about impact assessment as a process. Um, already around the world, in many countries, impact assessment is institutionalized. It's already there in a legal form or some sort of formal procedure often as uh, environmental impact assessment for major projects. Before we license them, before we let them uh, go ahead, we look to see what the environmental, social health consequences might be. So many countries have that form of uh, process. Similarly, uh, strategic environmental assessment is used in a number of places now, European Union through to places like China, Australia, it's already institutionalized at the policy and plan level um, to assist decision making. So there's uh, an institutional framework out there, but it doesn't have to have an institutional uh, basis for us to use it because ultimately it's just a way of thinking. Any decision that we want to make that would have repercussions for other people, for the natural built environments, we should be thinking of consequences and that's doing impact assessment. We can build that into any process, especially those relating to policies and plans and projects and so on, uh, to enhance those processes, enhance the thinking. So when we come to SDGs, the same thing applies. We can uh, uh, apply this thinking in a general sense to all of the SDGs uh, because they are about people and in many cases, the natural environment. And as we operationalize them, we want to make sure that those policies, plans and projects are not gonna create more problems. Uh, we want to make them as integrated and supportive as we can. An impact assessment helps us with that. We can also use specific forms of impact assessment for health, social, cultural, 
uh, ecological, gender, and so on, to inform very particular SDGs. Now, normally they would be part of an integrated approach that we assemble the different forms, which brings in particular skill areas for those impacts, and they would feed into an integrated overall assessment. But also in certain circumstances, we can use them as very specific tools to inform a, a very particular context. It's also important to recognize that impact assessment can be community led. It can give marginal communities and indigenous communities a tool that they can drive in order to get their voices into a decision process. Intergenerational equity uh, impact assessment, its whole ethos is looking forward and recognizing the implications into not just the short, but the medium and the longer term over the foreseeable life of a, a proposed action. It's underpinned by sustainability thinking. It's, although we tend to uh, emphasize the adverse implications, we're also looking for benefits that we can incorporate and improve, enhance the proposals. And we're promoting an integrated perspective because the environment ultimately is seamless. So we want to bring all those different sectors into the analysis where it's relevant to do that. Overall, impact assessment is seeking to avoid the impacts or minimize or mitigate them in those short, medium or longer terms. And if trade-offs are required, if we feel they cannot be avoided, at least we can make that transparent in the assessments to inform decision making and inform all the stakeholders in that process. So future generations are best served by minimizing adverse changes now, retaining options and opportunities for the future. There's a lot of impact assessment resources out there because there's already a well-established community of practice globally based on licensing major projects and also increasing use of policy assessments. Also existing processes such as regulatory impact assessment. And there's a guidance note on that worth, worth looking at. If I can point you to anywhere, it would be the International Association for Impact Assessment website. It acts that association is the international hub and has links to national affiliates and international organizations that use impact assessment. So thank you for listening. Um, if you want a bit more information on impact assessment, uh, there's links there to uh, on the last slide to a webinar I did for IAIA a couple of years ago, uh, 40 minutes um, understanding impact assessment. Thank you again for listening. Good luck with the rest of the workshop. Thank you very much, Professor Morgan, uh, for, your, for your paper. Uh, so I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Jose Morel, who is the author of the paper on long-term public debt management. Uh, Monsieur Morel, Mr. Morel, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, merci, madame. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. And greetings from Mauritius. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, you and Dessa for inviting me uh, to present this guidance note, uh, which I have a great pleasure to write towards the end of last year. Uh, let me share with you, if you bear with me one second, my presentation. Um, in this presentation, I will uh, briefly speak about the two areas which are discussed in the uh, guidance note long-term public debt management, and also um, the intergenerational equity. Uh, and I will explain how they relate to each other. And in the end, I will try and give some conclusions and suggest how countries uh, can better promote intergenerational equity uh, through long-term debt management. Let me just say that given the time available, I will only be covering some of the main points of a guidance note. And uh, at certain points, I may need to simplify things a little bit. Uh, but if you haven't done so, I would invite you to read the guidance note itself that has a more detailed discussion. 
I think we can start, uh, a good starting point is to look at the various policies that uh, governments have at their disposal to achieve macroeconomic and social objectives, including intergenerational equity. So uh, these are fiscal policy, uh, monetary policy that deals with the financial sector, interest rates, exchange rate, rate of inflation, or you also have uh, sectoral policies that target specific sectors, say agriculture, trade, and so forth. Fiscal policy uh, is an important tool, uh, and it is uh, a policy that is, has a strong relationship with uh, debt management, which we will uh, look at in detail. Uh, fiscal policy uh, is implemented, as you know, mainly uh, through taxation and also how the government spends its revenue. Um, and this is usually announced every year uh, during the budget speech. And fiscal policy can influence many areas, uh, including economic growth, employment, wealth distribution, and so forth. So let's have a look at public debt management. Um, governments actually borrow for a variety of reasons, and they borrow from different sources. Uh, the reasons uh, can range from short-term uh, liquidity requirements and cash management purposes, and for longer term, um, borrowing is usually for uh, funding large public infrastructure projects or social programs. And you have a lot of other reasons listed there uh, in between. In terms of sources of uh, borrowing, uh, we usually distinguish in debt management between domestic and external debt. Uh, domestic debt being uh, borrowing from um, residents, individuals or institutions, and uh, external debt uh, is, is, is borrowing from multilateral organizations, bilateral organizations, commercial uh, uh, banks, or international bond market. And what we find is that although the reasons uh, for borrowing uh, by governments uh, have remained essentially the same over the years. The sources of borrowing have evolved quite considerably over time. And the, uh, the note, the guidance note, describes the changes that have happened uh, to the sources of funding. So what is a public debt management? I think the presentation of Kenya gave us a flavor of this. Um, if we look at the definition of public debt management, it's basically the process of establishing and executing a strategy uh, to raise the required amount of funding at the lowest possible cost, consistent with a prudent degree of risk. So there's a trade-off really between cost and risk. And the task of a debt manager is actually to achieve an agreed balance, if you want, between the cost and the risk of borrowing. Now, what do you need uh, to be able to uh, uh, exercise or implement effective debt management? First of all, uh, the first area is governments. Uh, countries need to put in place uh, adequate legislation uh, for public debt management or public financial management. And they also have to put in place uh, institutions, uh, strong uh, institutions to manage uh, the debt. And I think the, the requirement to have uh, strong institutions was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations. So the legal framework should, for example, uh, state the objectives of debt management, who has the power to borrow, who has the power to issue guarantees, to whom can these powers be delegated to under what circumstances, the role and responsibilities of institutions involved in debt management, reporting requirements, and so forth. The second area deals with, uh, if you want, the, the tools uh, of debt management. Uh, so you need to have the IT systems for recording uh, your debt and uh, analyzing the debt portfolio. Uh, Data about debt needs to be uh, um, entered or captured into the debt recording system. And that data needs to be reported and disseminated to stakeholders. 
Now, why is this important? Well, countries do need to have comprehensive, accurate and timely debt statistics for various reasons. Country needs to know themselves uh, how much they have borrowed so that they can determine how much more debt they can contract. But they need also to plan for repaying the existing debt. They need to put in place strategies to manage the risks associated with the debt uh, portfolio. And debt statistics need to be disseminated both to domestic stakeholders like parliament, investors in government securities, the general public, et cetera, and external ones, including uh, creditors, credit rating agencies, and so forth. In fact, I'm sure that most of you will be aware that one of the top issues of debt management reform agenda in the debt management reform agenda at the moment is that of transparency, as there have been some high profile cases where there have been huge gaps in the published uh, debt statistics, gaps that amounted to even over 10% of GDP. The third area uh, is an area which I think uh, was mentioned during the presentation by Canada, is the oversight function. Uh, because debt, the debt portfolio is probably the largest financial portfolio in a country, uh, there needs uh, to be uh, an oversight function that ensures that laws and regulations are properly followed. And this is done at various levels within the debt management offices themselves through internal controls and audit and so forth, but also by external parties like the Auditor General's Office and Parliament also has a, an important role to play. And then finally, uh, the country must have in place a debt strategy, um, which uh, must be published, uh, is usually published uh, on a yearly basis uh, to uh, describe uh, the, the strategy that the government will adopt uh, to achieve a cost-risk balance, which uh, we, we mentioned before. Um, this complicated diagram, which is on page seven, uh, uh, actually attempts to uh, explain or to put together the various components that I mentioned before. So you have fiscal and monetary policies and the other policies, which contributes through the budget which is an annual exercise, but also uh, countries will have a medium-term budget framework. These contribute to the long-term economic and social objectives of the country. And you also have public debt management, with, which does the same uh, as well. And the uh, national um, development plans and objectives fit within the global and regional development goals, like the 2030 global agenda and so forth. So as you move from the bottom to the top, there's a time dimension that is involved. Mr. Let's Martin. talk a little bit about debt and intergenerational equity. Um, there are of course different views on how long-term debt contributes or doesn't contribute to intergenerational equity. And this is covered in detail in the guidance note. But I think putting aside economics, I think it is just intuitive that long-term debt is likely to have a positive impact on intergenerational equity if it's used productively and sustainably uh, on projects and programs that will benefit future generations. So- um, Mr. Morel, one moment, please. We lost your slides just to alert you that we have lost your slides. But we've been following. We've been following you very well too. Okay. Um, Please carry on, Mister. Okay. Mr. Morin. We've been because you've been explaining. We've been following. So you're back. Okay. Your slides are back. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when we reach the the last slide. Um, so basically, um, the conclusion of the. Um, of a guidance note is that um, debt is a major contributor to financing development and to achieving uh, better intergeneration equity. Uh, both because uh, debt management supports other policies, but also in its own right. 
But for this to happen, uh, two things must be, two conditions must be fulfilled. First of all, debt needs to be managed effectively. And these are the components that I mentioned before in terms of legal framework, institutions, and so forth. But also that borrowed funds must be used productively so that future generations can benefit from uh, the investment. Because at the end of the day, it, when it comes to long-term debt, uh, they may, the future generation will be the one to have to pay for this debt. Now, what can countries do to uh, strengthen, if you want, the, the link between uh, long-term debt and international equity? Um, personally, with, uh, I think that uh, countries need to reflect and agree on their uh, intergenerational uh, equity aspirations, because uh, in researching for the paper, it became clear that there are different definitions and nuances uh, as to what international uh, intergenerational equity is about. And these aspirations need to have a legal basis. Secondly, these intergenerational equity goals and objectives must be factored in or mainstreamed into macroeconomic <laughs> policies, be it fiscal policy, debt management policy, and so forth. And fi finally, uh, you know, uh, countries need to put in place measures to monitor and report on progress towards achieving uh, the, the goals of intergenerational equity. Uh, the guidance note mentions the example of Australia, which produces the intergeneration report, I think every five years. But we also heard today from countries, uh, other countries in the seminar that actually do so. And the last point I want to make is that in a sense, uh, intergenerational uh, equity appears to be a cross-cutting issue. So it is important not to overwhelm, if you want, the debt management office. So uh, a dedicated institution or department or unit that deals with uh, intergenerational equity somewhere in government is something I think uh, which would actually help uh, the situation. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And my apologies for the slides. Jose Morel, thank you very much uh, for your insights. So I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Frank Dont, who is the author of the paper on long-term territorial planning and uh, spatial development. Uh, Mr. Dont, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, madam. I... I hope you can see my slides. We and do, we I... do. Okay. All we right, do. so um, good, thank you. Well, I, I will be talking about long-term territorial planning and spatial development as a tool for uh, um, intergenerational uh, equity. Uh, also, I must say something, uh, a new angle for, for uh, the planning uh, profession uh, as such. So thank you for the organizers to uh, open that debate uh, and we can expand it uh, within our own uh, profession as well. Um, you will find my credentials, I think, in the chat box and online, who I am, who I represent. It was my pleasure to draft uh, this uh, guidance uh, note uh, um, uh, with, with, with valuable uh, inputs and, and reviews uh, by other planning experts. Uh, some of them are present in the room. I will only highlight uh, some points of it, uh, uh, but of course, I hope you will read the guidance notes, uh, which is available online. So the first slide is, is almost like a conclusion uh, to start with. Uh, it's the, the main uh, takeaways. And I, I, I use the title from a top-down shaping the future to a more bottom-up sharing uh, the future. And I will explain a little bit how I came to that uh, uh, title. The five uh, key takeaways is that development of places affects existing generations differently, yes? Secondly, development of places also affects future generations, obviously, but that is not always taken enough into account. Planned development of places is key for climate and biodiversity preservation and restoration. I would almost say if you don't plan it, it won't uh, be uh, addressed in a proper way. Integrated development of places is essential for coherent 
pos uh, policy making. And number five, the place uh, dimension of policies and actions is best focused in some kind of participatory spatial policy plan and or a design. Well, um, you know, it's a uh, still common um, to refer to planning in many countries as master planning or uh, to see the product as a master plan. You see that that photo on the left where a master planner is drafting or drawing a kind of land use plan, which is as often referred to a master plan. Well, my, my point here is that we have to move away from this uh, old style master planning to more collaborative uh, planning. And you see on the right side what it takes. It takes uh, uh, people working together, sharing ideas, uh, adding ideas, uh, and the planner is more a kind of facilitator than the, uh, than the master planner. The collaborative planning approach aims at combining long-term spatial visioning with short-term spatial interventions through stakeholder and community involvement. And of course, it should include intergenerational considerations. I will further explain. Now, understanding planning for places. See, in this note, uh, territorial planning, spatial planning, place-based planning, and even placemaking are all used as synonyms and go beyond uh, the outdated term of physical planning or land use planning and the more place uh, specific terms of urban planning and regional planning. So if I use one of these terms, uh, you have to think that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the first category or the, or the latter category. Uh, a definition of sustainable uh, spatial planning can be understood as the process of place-based policy making by the responsible territorial authorities to achieve better places with more compact urban development that are better connected by public transport and micromobility and that are climate resilient and socially inclusive. Now that's, that's a very compact sentence, um, but it needs a, a whole book, as you see on the right, the uh, 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 guidelines on urban territorial planning to unpack this uh, one sentence in all its uh, different uh, layers. Um, Understanding planning for places uh, means that we see long-term territorial planning and spatial development that it's most effective when a territorial lens is applied to all relevant policies. Uh, still too many policies are still are what we call place blind. Yes, it doesn't matter say, where you apply them in rural areas or urban areas. Well, it actually does matter. Yes, and uh, it also should contribute to intergenerational equity by either an age-based approach in all territorial planning processes and its outputs, uh, policies, plans, and designs, uh, as well a resource-based approach in planning that ensures equal access to resources for current and future generations, yes? Um, so this is when we uh, refer to, to uh, uh, planning. Now, uh, this is different from when we refer to spatial urban original development because that is what happens with or without deliberate planning, yes? And the absence of territorial coherence um, in a certain uh, uh, spatial development causes governance problems uh, such as dysfunctional urban spaces, broken ecosystems, spatial inequalities, and higher exposure to vulnerability to climate and pandemic crisis and other system shocks, yeah? Understanding the public planning of places, the public act of planning, yes. Well, really going back in time, planning uh, uh, is to be considered a uniquely human feature and the main enabler of urban civilization, yes. It was actually reinvented to uh, accommodate and mitigate the industrial revolution and related economic growth paradigm, including the colonization of territories and communities meaning that many planning approaches also have been spread around the world as a uh, tool of colonization. We have to be very, very aware of this uh, historical uh, feature, yes? Luckily, you know, planning gradually expanded into wholesale national and regional planning systems embedded in national regional legislative uh, frameworks, what we often uh, refer to as regulatory planning, yes? But uh, planning systems uh, uh, as such uh, 
most often did not or did not easily adapt to changes in society uh, and also ecological changes. And outdated or dysfunctional planning systems were and are often uh, bypassed or overruled instead of um, reviewed and reformed. And contrary to climate change response, there is actually no coordinated scientific political action to establish common global policy on planning system reforms towards a more metric based uh, sustainability planning. Yes, where are the metrics? Where is the one and a half point uh, centigrade uh, reference uh, in, in urban planning? We don't have that, right? However, we do have uh, the urban SDG among the 17. There is an urban uh, SDG number 11. There is also, since uh, the Quito conference in 2016, the new urban agenda. Yes, the first. Uh, and most comprehensive uh, uh, urban agenda, including a planning agenda. And uh, as already shown, there are also the international guidelines on urban and territorial planning uh, as global policy markers for place-based sustainability planning, yes? So based on all these uh, 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 markers, I would say, I present you like 10, um, uh, takeaways uh, from these uh, from these uh, policy guidelines um, and say uh, well they are uh, briefly presented here in yellow uh, getting the planning right at street and neighborhood level yes is is always the most important uh, entry point for uh, uh, planning and that is placemaking for and with the people secondly that's a whole other scale is uh, uh, applying national territorial policy frameworks including what we in many countries now start to know as uh, national urban policies, but they have to be also combined with national territorial policies. Yes, number three is strengthening regional sustainability planning, in particular for city regions, metropolises, and even the so-called mega regions uh, of 40 million inhabitants, which are popping up uh, all over uh, the globe. Uh, number four, embracing multi-level territorial governance, which is very different from the old style subsidiarity principle that always the lowest uh, 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 governance level uh, uh, needs to be, you know, a, in charge of, of, of uh, uh, placemaking or, or spatial planning. Yes, um, it's the right level and it's, it's a collaborative effort. Five, engaging children and youth in planning their futures. Um, well, this is the age and resource based uh, planning approach we already introduced a couple of slides ago. Number six is thinking and planning beyond uh, borders, which uh, for a starter is beyond municipal borders, but it's also going beyond uh, provincial, regional borders, and finally also beyond national uh, borders. So, uh, uh, happens, but not um, enough, um, is our assessment. Uh, number seven, reducing the use of remaining open space. And this is where metrics uh, start to kick in. We could actually have a kind of budgeting of how much open space there is left on the planet uh, that is inhabitable. Um, and start to say, well, we have to reduce our impact on open space, less uh, horizontal development, a little bit more vertical, but not always at the uh, uh, densities that are um, resulting in uh, uh, less quality of life. From smart growth to even, in some cases, degrowth, because in some areas we see a depopulation or a degrowth in population, which also should result in a degrowth in spatial occupation. Number eight, embracing nature-based solutions. This is really about climate and biodiversity responsive planning. Number nine, reforming outdated planning systems by establishing new sustainability planning systems. And 10, investing in planning education and capacity um, uh, both at institutional level, but also at grass, <clears throat> grassroots level. Now, this is the four last uh, slide. It's a bit complicated to explain now. Um, so I will uh, uh, invite you to, to read uh, the guidance note, but it, it tries to re re review uh, the planning system approach uh, within a theory of change uh, and within a you know, global, local uh, dialogue. So uh, no time to really go into detail, but please uh, read the note. 
And then the last slide is really that we have to um, enter the decade of action uh, planning or, or jump on the train of the decade of action to implement the SDGs and to look at the role of uh, sustainability planning, learning from inspiring practices. There are no best practices, but there are always very inspiring uh, practices. Peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, engaging in a global debate for sustainability planning. Well, upcoming is a debate on the new urban agenda five years after Quito, which will, will happen uh, 28th of April. End of June, we have the 11th World Urban Forum in Katowice in Poland. Um, a bit later, so we will have the 58th World Planning uh, Congress in Brussels, organized by ISOCARP. And then, of course, uh, uh, in November, so we will continue with the climate uh, debate in Cairo. These are just uh, some of the highlights uh, where uh, planning is uh, debated, and I hope that all of us will contribute uh, with a better understanding of what planning can be and should be. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Don, for your very interesting insights, um, you know, and the presentation of your paper on long-term territorial planning and uh, spatial development. Uh, so now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Geoffrey Gaber, who is the author of the paper on ecosystem management. Um, so, Dr. Gaber, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so, so much, uh, Dr. Toure, and thanks to, to SEPA for the opportunity to participate today. Um, greetings to all of you from Montreal, Canada, where I am. Well, as we've heard several times today, intergenerational equity is at the heart of sustainable development. Today, I'll be talking about how ecosystem management can be an effective strategy for promoting intergenerational equity consistent with Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. I'll just be skimming the surface of this broad topic, and I invite you to get more detail by reading the strategy guidance note, and I put the link to that in the chat. Um, in this opening slide, you see a photo of a monarch butterfly caterpillar on a milkweed leaf on the land where I grew up in Western New York State in the United States. Uh, the monarch butterfly is an important symbol of the importance of conserving ecosystems throughout North America because its ongoing survival depends on quality habitat and ecosystems in Mexico, United States, and Canada. And it's a threatened species. So that kind of habitat protection and ecosystem protection uh, is, is essential. Different kinds of ecosystem management are necessary, therefore, throughout the range of the monarch if we want future generations of Mexicans, Americans, and Canadians to be able to appreciate this symbol of ecosystem health and integrity. I'm sure those of you in other parts of the world can imagine similar species and symbols in your own region of the importance of ecosystems and their long-term protection and management. <clears throat> well, let's start uh, by considering what an ecosystem is. And the UN Convention on Biodiversity defines an ecosystem as a dynamic complex of plant, animal, and microorganism communities and their non-living environment interacting as a functional unit. So this is clearly a very broad term. It can be applied all the way from an individual organism to com communities or, or populations of organisms, to local systems, to biomes that are collections of local ecosy uh, ecosystems right up to the full uh, ecosphere. Um, they can also be wild, undeveloped, protected areas, or they can be working landscapes like uh, agricultural landscapes, and they can even include uh, urban areas. So we, we might even touch upon uh, the presentation we just heard from, from Mr. Don't. Um, now, a lot of ecosystem management typically uh, includes relatively undeveloped areas or protected areas at the local e ecosystem or landscape scale. But it's important to remember that e the broader uh, uh, scope of this term when we think of um, uh, eco-management uh, holistically. And what is ecosystem management? Well, this was, as a term, was first coined in 1992 in connection with national forests in the United States. These were working landscapes uh, with multiple uses under, under federal legislation in the United States. So they were used for timber harvesting, for grazing livestock, for recreation, they also had wilderness. And so 
there was a, a determination that that um, uh, the approaches to these uh, areas had to be uh, under the rubric of, of ecosystem management. Now the term uh, applies to things that were happening before then and have, and have happened uh, since then in, in a variety of diverse uh, contexts. So let me just review some of the core elements of what we're talking about here. First of all, when we're talking about management, we're talking about something that's intentional and goal-driven, uh, typically with a focus on sustainability of interconnected social and ecological systems. Uh, ecosystem management is grounded in systems-based approaches, consistent again with what we just heard from Mr. Don't, uh, and requires understanding of feedback, system dynamics, uh, and so on. Interrelationships uh, are, is key. Ecosystem management involves adaptive approaches. So in other words, to attain goals, uh, adjustments uh, need to be made based on monitoring um, and changing perspectives on what's happening uh, within the ecosystem. Uh, it incorporates collaborative decision making, so it needs to account for the values, capabilities, and interests of a variety of affected individuals and communities in establishing and working towards the goals of the management regime. Uh, it also involves a, 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 a comprehensive understanding of how to sustain ecological functions, structures, and processes. It's grounded in the science of ecology. And given the um, Given the state of the world, uh, ecosystem man management applies not only to intact or undeveloped areas where the goal might be ongoing conservation or preservation, but also to ecosystems that have been damaged. Um, in those cases, the goals are focused on ecological or, or ecocultural restoration. So given assessments of the Convention on Biodiversity, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and so on, and others on the degree of degradation of the world's ecosystems, restoration is now a critical aspect of ecosystem management. In fact, as many of you certainly know, the United Nations has designated 2021 to 31 as a decade of ecological um, restoration. So that's an overview of some of the key features of ecosystem management, and there are case studies in the guidance note that will give examples of implementation and results um, based on this basic uh, scheme. Um, ecosystem management, including restoration, is a key element of public sector responses to local to global sustainability challenges and policy responses. And, and these are reflected in many reports with which you're familiar. Now, we've talked a lot about the sustainable development goals. Uh, and so that's one uh, key framework for considering ecosystem management, especially goals 14 and 15, uh, but also two on, on, on hunger. Um, uh, and, and you've heard uh, of, over the course of the day other sustainable development goals that are relevant. The IPCC reports put in, into perspective, both in terms of mitigation and management, uh, some considerations that need to be part of ecosystem management. The reports of the IPBES are key and are focused specifically on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, sim that's, uh, you know, similar to that is the work of the Convention uh, on Biodiversity. Uh, and, and, and the, the, the post-HE goals and targets are now being formulated in the, in the two-part uh, conference in Kunming, uh, China. So uh, that uh, process will reveal uh, and produce uh, additional important considerations of uh, ecosystem-based approaches and what they need to accomplish. Um, planetary boundaries research, uh, the 2005 Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, many different regional and national assessments are all additional sources of information that are relevant to effective use of ecosystem management for inter intergenerational equity. There's also these emerging frameworks like, uh, like rights of nature, which I think is also relevant here. And that's, that's explained in the guidance note further. I also take note of in indigenous co-management that's happening where that's applicable. An example is in Canada where one of the newest national parks is now um, co-managing and I think even led primarily by uh, the indige indigenous groups in the Northwest Territories. That's the Thai Dene, Dene uh, National Park. And then ecosystem services frameworks are another way to approach uh, many issues uh, within ecosystem management. In terms of national policy and planning, it's really key to uh, develop a detailed understanding of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems that are under national jurisdiction, including those that tr transcend borders. Um, so it's important to keep in mind uh, 
the need to look at how ecosystems relate to each other, not to look at them in isolation. Um, and this means uh, looking again at ecosystems that transcend borders. Also understanding their, their role in sustaining, sustaining human and natural communities. That's a lot of the work around ecosystem services. How they fit into larger regional biomes and the biosphere as a whole. This brings into the connections with things like the planetary boundaries uh, research. Um, and then internal and external pressures and harm that human society imposes them on them. And those can happen within the ecosystem uh, itself that you're considering or outside. And both of those need to be um, taken into account. And this schematic uh, is, is explained further in the guidance note. You know, this, this may involve, for example, from a national perspective, uh, moving from a picture like this of Canada um, to a picture like this, it looks at the different eco zones uh, or these proposed eco provinces uh, that really put ecosystem-based approaches um, more into perspective. Um, this is a schematic that's also explained further in, in the guidance note on, on, on development of an integrated ecosystem management uh, policy uh, framework. So it gives a basic schematic of a, a public administration of an ecosystem management program. It shows how various stakeholders that are involved in the, uh, it shows the various stakeholders that are involved in the development of this kind of program, not just implementing agencies, but also legislators, local officials, civil society, ecosystem specialists, and so on. And it also shows an adaptive approach that's designed to ensure continual improvement over time as the program is implemented and monitored. Um, uh, of course, establishing an effective policy framework for ecosystem management requires adequate funding, resources, capacity building, expertise, training, and so on. And so broad commitment uh, to integrating ecosystem, ecosystem management into broader policy structures in government is also important. It really is best if it's not a specialized area um, uh, that's only uh, undertaken by one part of the government. It works best and is most effective. It's an integrated government-wide with strong commitment at central authorities. Uh, and this just takes a similar approach in, in, in looking at a, a case-specific approach of ecosystem management. Um, uh, again, there's, there's public awareness and participation. This is the, 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 uh, what I said earlier in regard to collaborative decision-making. Um, defining the, the ecosystem uh, uh, of concern, identifying the major issues, looking at the political, legislative, and economic schemes uh, that support uh, the, the ecosystem management scheme, and then, in, and then setting up uh, the, the, the ecosystem management program, again, in, a, in, 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 a, in an adaptive way. So that as you plan, implement, monitor, and evaluate, and take remedial actions, you are always um, adapting um, as needed to make sure that the, the program is effective in achieving goals. I've identified in the strategy, in the strategy guidance note, many resources here, some of the key ones at the global level, the, the, the Convention on Biodiversity, UNEP, uh, again, the uh, Intergovernmental Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, UN Decade on Ecosystem uh, Restoration, the IUCN, Global Ecosystem Management Program. All those have terrific resources, identification of focal points uh, within different countries and how uh, countries can get uh, support, capacity building, training, and so on to improve their uh, ability to have effective uh, um, ecosystem management. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Dufre uh, Gaba, for sharing your view. Uh, we want to give really the opportunity also to, to Ms. Kat Tully, who is the founder of, um, and managing director of the, at the School of International Futures. Um, we will take the time to uh, listen to your thoughts. Uh, Ms. Tully, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, can you hear me? Everything okay? We do, oh. we do hear you, we see your slide too. Fantastic, well, a very warm good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Lisbon, where I'm going to be talking about some efforts to build a framework to assess intergenerational fairness. And I will spend about six minutes really talking you through 
three different things. Talking about the origins and the purpose of the framework and how it's participated in the wider debate on intergenerational equity and fairness. I will share with you a little bit about the structure of the framework and how it's being used by policymakers and citizens in various different countries around the world. And then I'll share right at the end some cross-cutting insights on applying it. And a little bit of context from our perspective is that um, we did the guidance note on strategic foresight and strategic planning. And we see as Sophie Howe and others have been saying that there is a strong connection between this intergenerational equity for sustainable development work and the work looking at alternative scenarios and long-term planning. So these two issues are deeply linked indeed. So first of all, the origins of the framework. Now, Portugal um, has a very strong intergenerational fairness question. This is because there are 80,000 new Portuguese born a year and there were 200,000 born only 40 years ago. This creates tensions. So uh, a big foundation wanted to ask the question amongst political and citizens in Portugal saying, is there an issue, do people care? And the studies found, yes, there is an intergenerational fairness issue around pensions, around environment, around jobs, around housing. And politicians and citizens do care about questions of intergenerational fairness, but there's two problems. There is a constituency gap. No one picks up the phone when politicians are making decisions or legislation is being developed. And there is a lack of information. There's a data gap when policies are being designed. And so the solution is to close this with an assessment framework that has been developed and used actually interestingly enough by the Court of Auditors in Portugal, but also the Bank of Portugal, academics, civil society groups and youth groups. So we took that assessment and the work across Europe and beyond. And there's some very interesting at the highest level, whether it's in New Zealand, as we've heard, whether it's the court cases where young people are taking governments to court about intergenerational fairness. We know that there is interest. COP26, people were all talking about intergenerational fairness, but how do you operationalize it through an assessment was a key conclusion that many different governments came to that we need to do it. And you can do so through this assessment. And the interesting things that have really come to the fore are two, I think which is that in Germany, the Constitutional Court has recently ruled that there is a duty of current German businesses and government and citizens to not limit the freedoms of future German citizens. That is likely to be replicated perhaps in other countries around the world, this duty. And how do you therefore demonstrate now that you are fulfilling that duty? And there is a question around doing so and reflecting that in institutions and in dialogues. But there's a question that this intergenerational fairness principle also seems to be moving into the investment communities. And there is a question about how this is a foreign policy principle as well. So let's now move into what does the intergenerational fairness assessment look like? And this is a summary one sheet that basically here, it's an ex post assessment of a pensions reform that was done in Portugal in 2007. The Bank of Portugal used this assessment and effectively there are five conclusions. Is, was that decision implemented fairly to future generations? Quite fairly, it's too close to core or was it unfair? So it's also been applied in different places in the UK government, in UK parliament, where it's being used to review um, upcoming legislation, a future check. So citizens and other um, and backbench MPs are using it to say, is this upcoming legislation fair for future generations or not? And then it's feeding back into the system. So it's a definition that's based on um, uh, a, intergenerational fairness is based on the definition that is based on the Brundtland and the rules approach and around five questions. A policy is fair or unfair 
um, when these tests are met. And what you have is you have a series of implementation questions where the two key risks with applying an impact assessment around intergenerational fairness is that A, it is a tick box exercise and therefore this is used um, within an institutional context. The institutions that hold this, like independent ones, like um, the ones that we've heard from before are very important. But secondly, it has to be, as many speakers have already mentioned, it has to be based not on a technocratic definition of fairness, but one that is based on dialogue. So that is how it's progressed. So effectively, what you have is you have a policy assessment that doesn't really solve questions of intergenerational fairness, but it shines a light on fairness ex post and ex ante where it exists and creates space for the necessary conversation when policies are being developed or designed or implemented where different parts of society, whether it's independent agencies of government or whether it's citizen journalists or civil society groups can actually engage with policymakers to say, is this actually fair or not? How is the costs and benefits of this policy measure or this investment is it being distributed between generations alive or in the future? And I think just a few key insights that we've learned from this journey, um, applying it in about 10 different countries around the world and lots of different uh, types of policy uh, topics from local to national, is that um, it's helpful at the family and community level, not just at national and global level, that there is, um, we need to be very careful that social justice does not become the enemy of intergenerational justice and that they are complementary processes, not ones that are at odds. So you're not sacrificing, you know, the well-being of people who are homeless now because of the long term. It's also really important from a political perspective to frame this around intergenerational solidarity and cohesion around the interests of current and future unborn generations instead of framing it as a conflict between young and old alive at the moment. Um, it has to make a difference to the key political challenges of the day from Green Deal to digital transitions to building back better from COVID. The value of a senior states person to act and champion this topic as an intergenerational steward is key. That this is connected to calls and needs for having an intergenerational social contract and national dialogues, national listening exercises as our common agenda and the UN Secretary General called for. And that, as mentioned earlier, that this is actually core to the role of the UN Special Envoy on Future Generations roles. So I'll just leave you with a few, uh, a contact a series of contact details. Please reach out if you have um, questions on that, but look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tully, for your, for your views. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, obviously we don't have enough uh, time for discussion. We are even uh, running a little bit, uh, a little bit late. Um, so uh, we have come down to the end of our workshop. Uh, clearly, we need much uh, more discussion, um, you know, within ourselves. Uh, we had 231 participants uh, today at some point. Um, so, uh, you know, this discussion needs to, uh, needs to carry on, um, you know, and uh, it uh, illustrates itself uh, by both the number of speakers and the number of participants, as I said, the rich and, uh, and, and discussion uh, presented uh, today is a testimony that uh, we need to carry on on uh, exchanging view and ideas in this very important topic, uh, which is a very sensitive topic, uh, you know, to where I'm sitting here in, in Africa, um, because we tend to, uh, some people say, well, uh, to have a next generation, you have to make sure that this current, current generation lives and carry on. Um, so it's about uh, balancing, as it was said. Uh, what we have clearly uh, uh, heard today uh, is that we have to make choice uh, to make sure that uh, the choice we make today will not result in, in, in crisis uh, 
Um, and this is very important that uh, uh, we think about it as we make decision, as decision makers, but also as citizens. Uh, I like very much the idea of the solidarity and not opposing the youth and, and the older. Uh, I think um, we must encourage government to strengthen their capacity to understand and access uh, the, the, the future, uh, you know, by uh, building also long-term thinking uh, and bringing it into, into, into policy and decision making. We also uh, need to consider the creation maybe of specific institution to protect the, the, the interest of, of, of future generation at all level of governance. I think that's a good way to go uh, if we have to make, we make sure uh, that, uh, you know, uh, whatever we do in terms of planning, in terms of protecting the environment, in terms of debt management, we think of ourselves, what we also think of the future generation. I would like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation to our distinguished speakers and to all the participants. This concludes our workshop. Thank you very much.